What's going on, everyone? And welcome back to another episode of Bucci Radio. For those who are listening, welcome back. Bucci Radio! <laughs> and for those who are watching on YouTube, this is our first time recording for YouTube an interview really? with Bucci Radio. Yeah. Obviously had to record this All one. Right. I'm excited. <laughs> so obviously we're here to welcome the one and only Lewis House of the podcast. Thank you. Very excited to have you. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Anything for you. Of course. <laughs> I remember when we first started interacting, it was about a year ago, right? On Twitter, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. It was, well, n- well, it was kind of on Twitter, but I remember when you followed me on Instagram and I was like, Lewis House. <laughs> and I was, and you were liking my stuff, and uh-huh. then um, you posted about your mastermind. Yes. And that was probably a month after I even knew who you were. I knew nothing wow. about your podcast. I found you through Steve Cook's episode because I obviously know Steve from He's great. Fitness. He's great. And yeah, you posted about your mastermind, and that program has flipped my life upside down this year, and it's just been absolutely amazing. So thank you for everything that you do. You're welcome. You're for, welcome. So for those of you who You've don't know, you've been a know, star, and for those who don't know about Amanda, <laughs> she's like. I don't know, two, three extra business in the first like eight, nine months this year compared to last year. And it's been amazing to see your growth online. Your audience has been more engaged and growing like exponentially. I think you were like 200,000 followers maybe when we first met. I don't remember. Like on Instagram, maybe like 150,000 or 220,000. And now it's like well over half a million, right? You're close to 600,000. Uh-huh. Now. Maybe it's more of the time. This Even comes you out. too. You were down at like, yeah. not down. That's not like yeah, low, but so we were low. both like, you were yeah. at like a hundred. Now you're at four. Yeah. Regardless, Lewis has yeah. grown exponentially this year as well. And I'll tell you what, it's hard when you're a guy to grow. If I was just like a good looking girl <laughs> like you, I feel like it'd be so much easier just to be like. That's an excuse. That's I an know, excuse. I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. You've been absolutely crushing it. And uh, honestly, if you don't know about Lewis, we're going to go through like a couple just bullet points and then we're going to do some fill in. So Sweet. if you guys don't know about Lewis, he is the host of the School of Greatness podcast. We're actually in his studio. This is not my studio. This is his. This room is absolutely incredible. He's hosted over 500 episodes here to a million downloads a month now mm-hmm. on the podcast yeah. after five years. Yes. Which is absolutely insane insane and he's a former professional athlete he has turned into a lifestyle entrepreneur after some twists and turns that have happened in his life and honestly his core mission is to show people what greatness is how they can achieve it and how they can do so by digging up the meat of what has gone on in their lives and how to turn that into something great by just sharing your story and sharing the stories of other people on your podcast yeah yeah, and it's been it's been amazing to watch his podcast grow, even just from learning about it a year ago until now. And I just absolutely love your message of showing people what is tr- what is their truth, mm-hmm. um, and what they actually have to uncover in order to become great. It's not just magical, and obviously your success hasn't come out of thin air. Thin air. So why don't you tell us a little bit about where you first got started? I know this is like the basic question, but for mm-hmm. those who don't know you. Where were you in your childhood and how this kind of all came about? My whole dream was to be a professional athlete and to get paid just playing around all day. Like I thought that would be the greatest thing if I could just goof off the rest of my life, essentially play sports and get paid for it and have people cheer for me. I was like, what a great life. Sounds like a right? teenage kid's dream. Exactly. And um, so I committed to that for from the early ages. Uh, I just committed to like, okay, well, what's it going to take to be a professional athlete? First, I got to make like the middle school team, then the high school team. It was just like I broke it down and systematized my, my life early on. And I was like, what do I need to do every single day? I need to train a specific way. I need to get faster, bigger, like everything. I was so clear on my vision early on in terms of sports that when I achieved, uh, I went to the Arena Football League, got injured. My goal is to make the NFL got injured it was like my identity shifted overnight because I couldn't go play anymore and I was uh you know didn't have money I was on my sister's couch for about a year and a half recovering and I had this cast on and my whole life's dream was now gone and it was like in denial about what was next I was like I'm 23 I didn't have a backup plan I didn't have any other dream or vision and my whole life was wrapped up around this idea And that's where I got all my self-worth and my validation from. Mm. So now that this thing is not there anymore, how valuable actually am I in the world? And it was just like a lot of challenging thoughts and depressing moments and just struggle for that year and a half while I was on my sister's couch trying to figure out, okay, what's the purpose? Why did this happen? What am I doing next in my life? What's my life about? It's just like every question I had. And I slowly started to kind of pull myself out of this this place of just insecurity, frustration, and said, okay, I need to figure out, I need to make my life a sport. 
I need to use what I've learned in sports and, and apply this in my life. Mm. I need great coaches. I need a great team. I need a great, I need to like learn a new skill. Like what's my new sport going to be in life. And, um, all these things started to develop, you know, in the last eight years around kind of figuring out how to make money and marketing and business and branding out of a necessity and a need because my father had gotten into a pretty bad accident when I was 22, right before I went to play professional football. And he had always said, you know, go live your dream. You can train during the summers and I'll pay for you to like live and pay for your training and go fulfill that dream. And when you're done, you can come work for me. But when I was done, he had, uh, he was in this accident where he was in a coma for three months and was no longer emotionally and mentally capable of really being my father or mm. doing much. He's still alive, but he, I don't really see him much. I don't talk to him much because he's not emotionally available anymore. And I think uh, that was, that was probably the most challenging thing because I didn't have a backup plan. I didn't have my dad like bailing me out. Like I always thought like, oh yeah, one day I'm just going to work for him and his business. He had to sell his business because he was no longer capable of working there. And, um, and so I was like, what do I do now? And I just said, I started seeking out other kind of like father, like mentor figures to lean on them. Cause I didn't have my father anymore to lean on. And, uh, yeah, the, it was, it was this process of like finding these key mentors and then honestly just giving myself a challenge, giving myself a challenge that I'm going to learn something and try to get to the next step of something. I think that's a lot of ch that's a lot of problems that a lot of people face right now is they don't challenge themselves enough. And we do this in the mastermind a lot where I'm like, what are you going to create in the next 30 days? I remember like, specifically there was one question. I think I was coming up with one of my programs that I have now and I sent it to you in an email and you were like, okay, you're missing this, this, and this. What time and what day are you going to get yeah. it to me? And I was like, whoa. So that must have been similar for you when you first got your first mentor. Yeah, sure? I mean, well, this is stuff in like sports that is like just second nature for me. It's right. like we have deadlines. Mm. There's a game coming up mm -hmm. in a week, in a month, at the end of the season that we're preparing for. So we need to do something now, live in urgency right. every single day in order to get better for this game. Because if we're not prepared, we can't launch our vision, essentially win the game unless we're prepared and we take the actions necessary to make it happen. So again, I just started applying what I knew, which was sports into like, okay, let me do this in business and mm. let me start structuring this for myself. I would get ideas. I was like, I'm going to make a thousand dollars or five thousand dollars. How? I have no clue because I never <laughs> made any money. So I just said I would write down. I remember I started getting into public speaking. I met one mentor who at the salsa club actually because I started salsa club. I started taking <laughs> on salsa as an activity because I never drank. And going out to clubs and bars, I was like, this is boring. Mm. And I was like, I need to do something that I can master a skill and have fun and not drink. Right. And, and no one's really drinking at a salsa club because you can't like spin around and you're going to like fall over. <laughs> is, is the salsa club like a bar or is it like an open dance? It's like an open dance floor. Thing. There's a bar. The people have like one or two drinks, but it's normally like just kind of casually and you're mostly just dancing. Right. It's physical. It's like a new language that I had to learn because I couldn't really dance. <laughs> and, and so I was going, so this is one of my, funky athlete that's going it. To do salsa. this was one of my first <laughs> things that I was like, what can I do to, to learn something, to meet people and to not feel so sorry for myself. So I started going to salsa classes, private classes, group classes. I was going out three, four times a week. I was obsessed with learning salsa dancing. It was one of my first things that I learned. And when I was there, I was still broke. And when I was there, I met a guy. Fascinating people go salsa dancing, like the most educated, cultured, traveled individuals. It's just like the coolest people. And I met a guy who I came close with who I was like, well, you know, what do you do? And he's like, I'm a public speaker and I travel the country and get paid speaking mm. at colleges. And I was like, really? You can do that? And I asked him As if I... As you're like searching for your thing. Exactly. And I was like, really? Curious. I was like, but I'm like terrified of speaking in public. Terrified at this time. And I said, I, I'd love to just ask you some questions about it. And um, he, he he agreed. We met at the Barnes & Noble in Columbus, Ohio. I'll never forget this meeting. It was <laughs> at like the Starbucks coffee shop in the Barnes & Noble. And I was like, tell me about this public speaking thing. Like, how did you get into it? Like, how does someone do this? Mm. And he said, the first thing you need to do is go, like, overcome your fear of speaking in public. And I was like, well, how do I do that? And he said, join Toastmasters, which changed my life, mm. literally. He said, join Toastmasters do it for a year, then come back and talk to me when you're done. I found a Toastmasters club in Columbus, Ohio. 
I went every single week for that year. And it was the most terrifying thing I'd ever done in my life. Like the first three speeches I gave, I literally couldn't look people in the eyes. I was so nervous and afraid of what people would think about me and just everything. Um, So I just started taking on these mentors who would give me like a different challenge. He was like, Mm. go do this every week for a year and then come back. Now, was it the mentors that pushed you out of your comfort zone? Because obviously after such like a life crumbling injury yeah. and you're just down on yourself and mm-hmm. it's really hard to pull yourself out of that feeling. Was it the mentors that pulled you out of it or just like you're kind of. It was a, a combination of things. One, like I was living off my sister and, and eventually she kind of pushed me and said, okay, you've got to pay for rent or you've got to do something. So mm-hmm. you should go get a job. This was after a year and a half of me kind of just like being depressed about it all. Right. And I was also just like self-reflecting. I was like, there's got to be more to my life than this, what I've had. There's got to be something, there's got to be a reason. I just felt my whole life there had to be a reason why I was going through everything in my life. Mm. Why I was sexually abused, why my brother went to prison, why my sisters tried to commit suicide and tried to attempt suicide on themselves, why my parents got divorced, just why I went through the hardships in all these relationships that I had with women why I was constantly like beating myself up inside. I was just like, there's got to be a reason why I'm here. And I was always asking that question. And so when I was, you know, on my sister's couch, I was reflecting on this. I was like, what's next for me? I'm 23. Why am I here? There's got to be something bigger than just this. There's got to be a reason my dad just got in this accident. There's got to be a reason why I'm injured and I'm not able to play this anymore. So I just said, okay, I'm going to figure out why. I'm going to figure out why I'm here and what I'm supposed to do, at least for the next year or two years. And I think it was that self-reflection that made me say, you know what, I'm not finished. I'm not done. Like, I'm going to do whatever it takes to to be somebody, be something of value in the world where I'm not just like this washed up arena football player that never does anything afterwards. I just felt like I've always, there's always been something greater for me and I've wanted to make an impact on people. And I knew that I had to go through so many things that I was afraid of to overcome them first in order to reach people. Because I couldn't stand in front of a room and, and, and share a story. I couldn't write. I couldn't interview people. Right. I couldn't do any of these things. I've been terrified of them all. So I said, okay, I need to learn how to not be afraid anymore. And I started giving myself challenges of all the things I was afraid of. Mm. I was like, okay, I'm afraid <coughs> to speak. I'm afraid to dance. I'm afraid to talk to strangers like girls Mm -hmm. whatever it is i was like all the things i'm afraid of i'm going to give myself a challenge when i moved to new york city in 2010 i was single and i remember saying like i'm kind of scared of this city like i don't know anyone here new york is scary i feel like it's scarier than la right but i was just like from a small town in columbus and you know in ohio and i was like okay i'm going to this big city and i remember i was like i came up with this challenge i go i'm going to create a challenge for myself. I called it the Red Rose Project. I didn't tell anyone about it. But for me, it was my <laughs> own challenge. And I said, every single day, I'm going to buy a, a red rose and I'm going to give it to a girl on the street that I was just like, wanted to have a conversation with. Whether she was attractive or not, I just like, I just wanted to give a girl a rose and start building relationships. And it was terrifying to like go up to like strangers and be like, hey, I just wanted to give you this. And some <laughs> girls were like so nasty and rejected me and just like threw like, brush me off and other people like we had these really cool conversations but I realized like everything I was afraid of I needed to overcome Mm. and that's what has allowed me personally to have this deeper sense of belief and confidence in myself that hey even though I've never written a book or done a big event or done this thing or done that thing like who cares if I've never done it because I'm starting to believe in myself more because of the things I'm embracing which are my fears and um, it's been powerful. And the more and more I've opened up about my fears, the more I feel like I can do anything. Because for so long, I was afraid to let people see those things about me. And that's one of the reasons why I wrote this book. It's because when I opened up four years ago about being sexually abused for the first time, and just about all the things I was ashamed of as a man, as a human, all the things I was afraid of that I didn't want anyone to know about me, when I finally started opening up, it was like this ultimate sense of freedom like for the first time, I didn't feel like I was a prisoner inside. Mm. My whole life, I felt like I was a prisoner to my thoughts, my shame, my guilt, my insecurities, my fears. And so I would project 
this person I wanted people to see me as, to try to fit in all the time. I always try to fit in in sports, school, classmates, whatever. I was just trying to fit in. And every time I was trying to fit in, I was dishonoring who I was because I was projecting something I wasn't proud of to try to get someone to like me and like be my friend because mm-hmm. I was always afraid to be alone. And when I finally was able to like open up and say, here's who I am world, like take it or leave it. It was like the most unbelievable thing that ever happened to me because so many people accepted me and trusted me and loved me more. People were like, I will follow you anywhere. If you're willing to reveal these things, like, wow. You know, I've had these secrets for 40 years that my wife and my kids don't know about me. Right. And you've inspired me now to, to talk to my wife about something I've been terrified of. And when men started to open up to their family or their friends about these things they're afraid of, it was like they had the freedom. Mm. And it's like the weight of the world that these men were carrying were finally being released. And I was like... There's something to this, you know, the most terrifying thing that we face, there's something to like embracing it Mm -hmm. and becoming like the Batman, you know, like Batman is like afraid of the bats and now he wears a cape for everyone to see his, you know, his fear. And I felt like that's what I, I wanted to start doing more of that. The thing that I'm afraid of, I want people to see it and for me to see it and to be like, okay, why am I afraid of this? What's the worst thing that's going to happen? How is this going to affect me if I fail, if people judge me, if I lose? And how can I embrace it to get better so that it doesn't put me in this prison? Because otherwise we are trapped in our minds of insecurity and fear and living with masks on for our whole lives until we start to embrace those fears. So I just went on a tangent. But no, no, no. Yeah. I'm so glad you went there because yeah. I definitely wanted to go into the book. Yes. Um, I usually... If I read a book, I don't usually read the whole thing. Don't finish it, yeah. I'll me usually either. read like half or three quarters, and I'm like, all right, it's I got the than, gist. It's more than me. But yeah. this book I finished this morning all Thank the way. You. It was I couldn't put it down. Ask Brian. I was like, I can't put this book down. Like, I want to read the whole thing. Appreciate and I read it. it in a week. We got it. I think we got it. We got it at the Summit of Greatness yeah. um, when you yeah. gave it to everybody, mm-hmm. which was super generous. And I have not put it down until this morning when I finally finished it. So incredible, incredible book. It's a really important message. So you've been on this journey from the last four years, Mm -hmm. kind of since you opened up about your story and you've seen what it's done to the world from just you opening up. Uh What has happened between last year when you wrote the school of greatness and this year to formulating this book? Oh man. I mean a lot. I mean, I started talking about my story and my insecurities and my fears four years ago. And I started a little bit right about it two years ago in my the book, The School of Greatness. Just mm-hmm. kind of like kind of hinting it, but it was like the last couple pages. So like most people don't finish books. So hopefully they're not <laughs> going to see like my insecurities fully. Right, right. But people who finished it were like, dude, like you just dropped a bomb at the end. I was like, yeah. So I started kinda hearing. hiding that. Yeah. I was, wasn't was fully al- allowing myself to reveal myself. Right. I was still scared. And, but it was, it was helping like my, my business was, um, impacted in a powerful way by me just being more vulnerable on my podcast. People were noticing. They were like, mm. is there something you're doing in your podcast before I started opening up? They were like, something's changed in you, Lewis. Like, whatever you're doing, I don't know what it is, but just keep doing it. It's cool. So like, okay. Um, <laughs> and just like intimate relationships with people, you know, in my business, my, my team. It's just like I'm w- a willing for people to see me as not perfect. Mm. I'm willing for people to see like my insecurities. Now, I'm not constantly talking about my insecurities because I think that's not authentic either. If right. you're just like every day looking for people to like say, oh, what was you or something. But I'm share. I'm not afraid to share about the things that I'm ashamed of or insecure about or whatever it may be. And I feel like when I do that, it's like my business grows and like all these things happen and people are like, oh, I trust you now. Right. Like I've been judging you for this, this long period and now I finally feel like I can trust you because you're not just like projecting this perfect image. I was like, oh, okay, so trying to not act perfect, everything gets better in my life. I was just like, all right, let me just keep revealing. And I, I decided that there's so much pain and suffering that a lot of men were facing. Like I felt like I was feeling so much inner pain my entire childhood. Now listen, I'm white American. I had like, you know, a home and all these things. But the inner darkness that I felt was profound for me. 
it was the stories yeah. that I was telling myself. It was very dark. And inside. you don't have to minimize what you went through just exactly. because you are. But I think a lot of people like, say that. We're like, well, you don't know what it's like because you're white and you male privilege and these things. And I get it. Like, I had privileges. You know, I didn't go through other challenges that other people faced. Women, people who aren't white, you know, people with different, you know, mm. gay people. Like, all these things, I face different challenges. So I'm not minimizing them or me. But for me, I didn't have the emotional tools to cope with a lot of the things I was going through. I think like most of us. And I realized that there are a lot of men that I grew up with in the same mentality, kind of like the jock Midwestern guy who aren't able to fully express themselves either and feel like they need to carry this weight. And I realized like, man, it's just hurting a lot of the world with this mentality of I need to be right and other people need to be wrong. Mm -hmm. I need to win at all costs and that means <clears throat> everyone else needs to lose. So when we are right and we win at all costs, we're essentially saying, okay, I'm on this island and no one else can join me on this island. So I'm isolating myself from the world and to prove to the world that I'm worthy of the world. But we're right. separating ourselves from everyone else by making them wrong or by making them feel like a loser. And that's what I was doing my entire life until four years ago. And I realized that a lot of men aren't even aware of this, but we're doing this. And some men aren't, but there's a lot of men that I grew up with who are. I could imagine every single person reading this book will think of many of the men or even women in their yeah. life that this can connect with. Absolutely, yeah. And I just said, like, there's, if I'm going to do anything, it's got to be the most meaningful thing I've ever done next. And this was, like, terrifying me to think about. Like, revealing, like every chapter you read it, I share shit about myself that – Oh, yeah. Is like, I really don't want people to know. It's not fun for me to share like all the things that I've done, all the friends and family, me family members who are going to read it and everything. It's terrifying. My girlfriend yeah. read it and she was like, you know, <laughs> kind of hurt by certain things. She was upset right. for a few days. She was like, she wasn't, I didn't go into certain things with, with her personally, but I went into things where she didn't fully know. And she was like, it kind of hurts me. And I'm like, I'm sorry. Like, but, but that's good yeah the opening up of yes. that is is important for it's and it's important for you to share yeah so other people can feel okay sharing exactly yeah and i just felt like this is something that is so needed i wasn't aware that all these racial conflicts and all the the trump challenges and everything was going to happen after i decided to write this it just so happened that there's so much conflict in the world and that's why i'm so excited about this because i believe that it will help heal one person at a time who can make a better decision towards how they perceive someone else, how they interact with them, how they show up either in a win-win environment and how can we support one another. And if we can shift that one person at a time, I believe it's going to start to heal a lot of the pain that men have and, and a lot of the relationships that men are having as well. Absolutely. So let's yeah. totally dive in. So one of my favorite quotes, um, I wrote it down and it was like in my little notepad. Yes. So a big part of my previous book and podcast, The School of Greatness, is mm -hmm. about achievement and the joys and thrills of it. I'm proud of my achievements just as my guests are proud of theirs. But what I'm saying and what my guests have taught me is that it's important to pay attention to the costs of your achievements. Yeah, the prices. The prices we pay. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, the prices you pay, yeah. uh, uh, not just And the achievements achieve, we have. And yes. the achievements that you have, but what it means to achieve to a man and what it does to him. Yeah, well, I think it's, it's a couple of things to unpack here. You know, the prices we pay in achieving if we're hurting other people is a deep price. And I lived, my achievements were always above everything else. And then I would achieve because it was to prove people wrong and to say, hey, I'm going to do this in spite of you. I'm going to do this to prove the kids who bullied me in school. Mm -hmm. For the last 10 years, I've been driven to prove people wrong. And so when I would achieve... I was so unfulfilled within minutes after my achievements. Every, right. Everything I wanted, right. I had it. And then I was like angry and upset at the world and upset at my family. I was just like I was nasty to be around within moments after I achieved. Because I thought for some reason it was going to make me feel like better about myself. And it never did. It never made me feel good. So there was this price that I was paying because I was like, okay, I need to achieve something bigger to prove to myself and to prove to these people that I'm worthy of whatever it is I was looking for. Because your self-worth was attached to whatever It was attached achieved. to achievements. But then, and it was like, it never, you know, until, until four years ago when I was 30, it never 
nothing ever felt good. Achieving things never felt good for me. I could never actually celebrate them and enjoy my victories Mm. because it was coming from a place of proving people wrong, needing to be right, which meant everyone else needed to lose and be and be wrong. Mm. And when I finally started shifting that to I'm going to set a new vision for my life. I'm going to achieve something because I wanted to lift others up and inspire, not to put others down and make them wrong. It just feels so much better. Like I'm still just as driven. Right. And I can take a moment to celebrate for like a day. Like, wow, look what we did together. And it's not all on me. It's on we. Mm -hmm. So it's like incorporating my team. You know, you have a team now and it's like, what can we do to impact? It's so much more fulfilling when it's less focused on you and what you need to get out of the achievement versus what the achievement can do for the rest of the world. Yeah, exactly. How can we as a team come together to to support each other? Mm -hmm. And with what we're working on, how can we impact the people who are part of our mission? That is like a far greater reward than the uh, just the accomplishments that I can like put on my bio that I had in my before I was 30 that made me feel good, like gave, gave me self-worth, but it just was never enough. So I just think we're always going to be unfulfilled until we come from a bigger mindset of like, I'm here, I'm doing something, not even to like prove to yourself, but to lift others up. Mm. And when it's always about you, there's got to be some price you're paying, a heavy price. Right. If it's about making others wrong. Like I used to love posting quotes like said, just prove them wrong, right? I used to love that. <laughs> like I'm I, all yeah, about Yeah, I can't believe that you would have posted that now knowing you who you are now. It's like Yeah, I mean, even now I'll like see it, I'm like, Yeah, prove those bitches wrong. You know, it's like, I'm like me against the world. Exactly. Yeah. And I kinda like I've always felt this underdog feeling of like, yeah, it's like me versus the world. And I still kinda like that, like prove them wrong. It's just like it's kind of like a quick little hit of like inspiration, but I'm like now prove them right about you. Prove them right about like the goodness in you, like the people mm. that do believe in you. Prove them right and like lift them up and celebrate those people. Um, it just sounds cooler, I guess, when you say prove them wrong. It's like, yeah, the anger of you. But um, yeah, so I'm more Well, that's mindful. one of the masks in the book, right? The yeah. anger. The aggressive mask. Aggressive, yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that too. Like I want to know from your mm-hmm. perspective, what is a mask and how do we build them up in our lives and then yes a mask is a defense mechanism that protects us from getting hurt Mm -hmm. that protects us from people making fun of us from people not accepting us um from people making fun of us it's a a thing that we learn to wear very well to fit in with other people Mm -hmm. and when we wear it to fit in we are dishonoring who we truly are because we're saying i'm not comfortable enough with who i am So I'm going to give you what you want so that you'll accept me. And that is a a recipe for disaster. It's a huge price you pay. And a lot of men and women wear masks and we wear it our whole lives. You know, I wear masks still all the time and I'm just so much more aware of it when it happens, you know, in my relationship, something will happen and I'll get aggressive or I'll get frustrated or I'll get passive or whatever it is. And I'm like, okay, take a breath. I'm like, I'm doing this because I'm afraid. I'm doing this because of this. And I'm able to remove it and to be like, you know what? I'm sorry. I love you. Like, let's work this out, you know, as opposed to me versus you. Let's focus on we. And it's hard when you have this conditioning as a man or a woman, your entire life for certain things. And the thing is, these masks serve us in a lot of ways. So when I was broke, I was like, I need to make money. I can't be broke anymore. So the material <clears throat> mask served me well. I right. wore it. I fixated on making as much money as I could. And what ended up happening is I gained 60 pounds because all I did was work and focus on money. I was hanging out with some sleazy people who had money, but I was like, I just need to learn from you. Right. I started to do things in my business that I, just to make money that weren't fulfilling. And I was like, ugh. Is this really like an integrity? Is this really like authentic? Mm. And that's something something you ask yourself all the time now when you're presented with a new business business decision. Absolutely. Is this aligned with my vision? Is this going to lift people up or Mm. is it just to make money? So Mm. I pass on a lot of money making opportunities now because I'm just like, doesn't support my vision. Mm. But when I was wearing the mask, it was like whatever it takes to make as much money and be around those people who made a lot of money and like maybe do some compromising things just to make money. Mm -hmm. It served me and it helped me make a lot of money. 
So it worked. This is what guys say. Wear the athlete mask, wear the sexual mask, wear these things. Like it works. You get results on the outside. But on the inside, I was suffering. I was unhealthy. People called me Fluis for Fat Lewis because I was 60 pounds overweight. They called you Fluis. I had like the chubbiest <laughs> oh cheeks. God. Like I'd never been overweight in my life until I went into the material mask. Do you have mask. a photo? That we I've got some photos. Yes, I got some photos. Okay. I'll, send, I'll find one. Send me the photos. And uh, it was bad. Like I remember looking down one time. I was like 200 and I think I was 260 pounds. Wow. And I was looking down. I Maybe mean, it was 265. And I was looking down, and my underwear was rolling over, and I was just like. This is just not the life that I envisioned for myself. You know what I mean? For my health. And I was like, I, it was a wake up call where I was like, I've been so fixated on making money. And it worked. So why stop doing the thing that works for us, right? right. That's the challenge. And that's the cost of achievement. Absolutely. The, cost it's the for price you, you pay. Is, yeah. It's the price you pay is like, my relationships were a mess, my health was a mess, my inner peace was a mess. In some sense, I was gaining inner peace because I had this money in the bank now. Mm. So it was like it worked, but it was like if everything else is paying a heavy price, it doesn't work then. It's like one sliver of the pie. Exactly. And so it's learning about, okay, how can I step into this way of being, but also step out of it in other mm. situations and also make sure I'm taking care of my health and my relationships and the other parts of life that bring us inner peace, that bring us fulfillment, bring us meaning. Because if we're living with a mask on full time, people will never get to see who we truly are. Mm -hmm. And we're going to feeling like we're trapped. We're just going to feel like we're angry and trapped and upset within ourselves because we can't be ourselves. No one wants to live that way. No one wants to feel trapped. But when we put a mask on, we're literally putting ourselves behind bars. So what are two, let's talk about two other masks yeah. that you have worn in your life. The aggressive mask and the athlete mask mm. and the sexual mask for sure. Um, I mean, the athlete mask, when I was bullied and picked on and, and picked last in sports when I was in elementary school, I said to myself, I'm going to be the biggest, fastest, strongest human I can be so that no one will ever be able to pick on me again so I can defend myself so that I'm picked first in all the sports games. Mm -hmm. And I wore that athlete mask with like a badge of honor. I was like, this is who I am. This is my identity. But it didn't support me because I would get in fights. I defended myself at all costs and right. like used the aggressive mask to be like angry and punch kids and get in fights and just talk trash when it didn't mean anything because I was always trying to defend myself. Mm -hmm. So kind of the athlete and aggressive mask together, I wore very well. And sexual mask, you know, there was times where I was like, when my early 20s, when relationship didn't work out, I was just like, heartbroken. I was so heartbroken and terrified to be alone. And so when relationships wouldn't work out for it took me forever to, over, to overcome like the breakups, I just mm -hmm. didn't have the emotional capacity. And I was such a sensitive kid. And I didn't allow my sensitivities to come out. But when like the breakup happened, it was just like I was heartbroken. And I didn't know how to be alone and accept myself. It was like she doesn't want me. It was just like so the world is over. Shattered. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was just like a nightmare. And I was like, screw her. Like I'm going to be so desirable and have every woman want me and just like become – you know, a magnet for women to want to have sex with me. It was like, you know, that was my mission. Mm -hmm. And Your it mechanism worked. Against using the, yes. yeah. And I was like, it worked. All these <laughs> girls want to have sex with me and want to be with me. And they all want me to be in a relationship. And I was like, it worked. So what was the cost? The cost was so much emotional drama, so much like drainage of my energy away from living a more purposeful life and living a vision of meaning as opposed to just like constantly hitting up different girls and managing five girls a week or whatever about who am I going to go on a date with and try to sleep with. Mm -hmm. And it was exhausting and dramatic and draining and but hot and sexy and fun at the same time. So it got me the results I was looking for. But the costs were high and zero fulfillment, zero intimacy, zero real connection. It was all just like, you know, fun sex connections and um it left me feeling alone it left me feeling exactly what i didn't want to feel mm. so these masks really 
again, support us in what we think we want, but hold us back from what truly means the most to us. So when did you figure out what truly means the, the most to you? <sighs> I mean, I think I'm still figuring it out yeah. every single day. I think it's like a journey I'm constantly on because life evolves and shifts and changes so much. But really four years ago, I started like questioning all the things and the decisions I've made and the things I'm doing moving forward and every relationship that I'm in, not intimate, but just relationships in general and what works towards my vision and who I want to be and all these things. So it's an ongoing process and I'm definitely, I mean, if you read, if anyone reads the book, you'll see that I'm not perfect still and I don't. Which I admire that take that you took in the book yeah. about where you are at and y that you're not perfect and you're still working through things. Yeah, yeah. So I, what are some habits that you have now that allow you to continue to continuously keep the mask off or do your best to? <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's having the tough conversations when you're afraid to with the people you don't want to share to have those conversations with. So family, friends intimate partners like having those conversations you need to have mm. it's really hard to do but doing that is uh is helpful i surround myself with people that i trust who are going to give it to me straight who aren't like afraid to talk to me about certain things if my ego is coming up i i tell my friends like give me feedback mm. if i post something online like i'll have close friends and coaches like text me and be like eh, I don't know what you're doing. You sound a little defensive <laughs> there. Like my brother calls me out on stuff. He's like, yeah, for two years, you've been pretty good. But for the last two weeks, like you've been defensive and everything you've been posting. And I'm like, fuck, really? Like, oh, I don't feel like I am. But what do you okay. mean defensive on what you post? Just like, like needing to defend myself or something. If like I'm, when someone questions your integrity and you respond back. Kind of thing. That or just like if I just post something in general, he'll be like, it kind of came from a defensive tone. Like you were trying to like defend yourself or something and like you don't need to do that. Mm. so why are you doing it and so it's like being receptive to hearing feedback from people i trust is really helpful and just like again my team i surround myself with really good people who are will give it to me like nah i don't think this is integrity or this is this is not like where we want to go as our vision and so mm. i feel like I've, i'm pretty lined like i'm pretty good pretty much most of the time but having that support allowing myself to have those tough conversations is the hardest thing to do um, and I think constantly growing myself, you know, having my show where I get to ask people questions and learn, it gives me a different perspective as opposed to my own single minded perspective. Right. It allows me to see other people's point of view and have empathy and compassion for other people and realize I get to continue to grow as well. Yeah. It's a super, I'm glad that you brought that up with your show. Cause mm -hmm. I, that brings me to my next question is that you're very much a representation of someone who knows that a collective is more powerful yeah. than just an individual. Mm -hmm. So how do you go about picking guests for your podcast and then picking your team members? Cause obviously that's all really important to you and yeah. your understanding of humanity and how you live. Mm. The guests for the podcast for me, it's tough because lately I've had a few people who are like friends or like <clears throat> big entrepreneur people who've been reaching out to me and like, pushing to come on my show that I've got a book or whatever they want to promote. And they're like, Hey man, can you get me on? And I'm like, if like, I, I have a specific show where I just want to have the greatest of what people do in the world to come on. So and then how do you tell someone that they're not the greatest? Exactly. It's tough. Cause I'm like, <laughs> you know, it's really, I am here to serve my audience. It's not about me. It's not about my relationship with someone like mm. I've gotten fights with some family members who wanted to come on, who I was like, it doesn't make sense mm -hmm. who were hurt that I wasn't supporting them. And I'm like, I'm sorry. This isn't a, a thing for you or me. It's a thing for my audience. And right. yes, it's a channel for me to do other things, but I am committed to growth in my audience. And if I don't feel like the person has to come on and be the top of what they do in the world, or be something that is so inspiring to me that I believe 90% of the people will be just as inspired. If it's like, yeah, maybe 20% of people were inspired, it's not enough. Mm. It's got to be 90% minimum that people will be inspired because I have such a collective group of 17-year-olds to 70-year-olds and men, women, and athletes and executives. At the Summit of Greatness, there was not one type of person. Right. It was amazing. It was a type of it mindset. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's why I'm like, it's got to fit this mold for everyone to be inspired mm. 
that's just the type of show that I have. And it's like a blessing and a curse because if it was just like the entrepreneur business show, I could get all types of entrepreneurs and just do that and make everyone happy. So I've lost like a lot of, I've had a lot of people be unhappy with me. And even now people are texting me to this, this morning where it was like, Hey, the book's coming out. And I'm like, Fuck, I can't, what am I going to say? You know? <laughs> and I'm like, let's just do a Facebook right. live, you know, or whatever. So, right. um, yeah, so that's where it is with the show in terms of people on my team. It's got to be like a feeling for me and energy. They've got to be positive because I believe attitude is the most important thing. If someone is great at what they do but has a negative attitude, mm -hmm. it ruins it for everyone. So right. first thing is like positive, growth-minded, willing to learn, willing to get better. Um, and someone who's committed to the vision, committed to the vision and wants to get results. If they have those three things, a positive, positive mindset and attitude, they're committed to the vision and they're willing to – um, grow to learn how they can get better in the business and they're committed to getting results that's what I look for because if you can't do those three things then I need someone who can otherwise we won't progress as a business I love that because it's it's really difficult for a lot of people to make those really tough decisions it's hard. so how do you this is like a kind of difficult question how do you make those self-honoring and mission honoring decisions when your demand and your time your time and yourself are so in high demand now and it's continuing to get in higher demand as your show grows, as your brand yeah. grows. You're talking about with my team or with what? With your guests and what uh -huh. you do in business decisions. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, I'll talk about with my team first off because it's tough because I learned so many conflicting ideas from people I have on my show. Like I've learned different ideas of different perspectives. And one perspective is like if someone's not getting results, my friend is like, you got to cut them out. He's like, I'm constantly looking to cut people out, right? Right. And, uh, and then I had another perspective of someone else who was like, would you cut your kid out of your life? Mm. Like, would you just say, eh, you're not cutting it as like seven year old right now. Like time to get rid of you. I totally feel that. And I'm I've like, heard that too. You know, yeah. I'm like, uh, well, like, so I think there's a dance of like tough love with some of the people on your team. We're like, listen, we really need to step up. I can't be paying this. You're not paying your kids, so it's different. But, I mean, <laughs> can't be, like, paying this for the next six months or a year if you're just constantly making mistakes. So it's having an open communication. It's really being like, we need you to step up. And um, here's the challenge. If you can't fulfill this, then you're, you're telling us that you don't want to be on part of this team. So it's like creating that kind of win-win in that experience, not just being like, you're fired, like in a, right. the first strike or whatever. And I think having those tough conversations with yourself, like, am I doing my due diligence yeah. as a leader? Yes. Yes. Before you bring people on too. Mm -hmm. It's more important to bring people on and really do the due, due diligence as opposed to, I need someone now. This person looks good. Let's do it. Right. Like slow to hire. It'd be very slow so that you know it's the right fit. Like mm -hmm. give them a test. I give people tests, you know. Yeah, I I'm, love that. I'm working on a video editor right now where it's like they're doing a bunch of video tests for me for free to see if they're even like willing to do it, do it w based on what we need them to do can follow instructions, can do it on time, like can be positive about it when not getting paid. And then we'll see how it is. So it's like, as opposed to just, okay, cool, you can do video, you're hired. No, let's make sure it works first. Yeah. Cool. So now that you have so many things going on, you have a million things going on, you have TV show, book launch, next year's Summit of Great, you have a million things. Yes. How do you balance your business and wanting to be just a giver of yourself with self-care? Like, what do you do for self-care? I have a trainer now full-time. I saw that. That so is exciting. a game changer. It's Love changed that. everything because it's hard to keep yourself fully accountable. I mean, you're in the fitness space and you even understand there's probably some days where you're like, oh, well, I have I a trainer and a coach too. Oh, you do. There you <laughs> yeah, go. I, but before you it. didn't always, right? No, no, no. Yeah. It used to be easier. And it's, you know, it's easier if that's all you're doing, I guess. And you're just like committed and obsessed with fitness. But I love sports and fitness myself, but it's just like, it's hard, man. It's hard to stay accountable to everything in your life. And that's why I think having a, a trainer has been a game changer because I've already, I've already lost 10 pounds. Yeah. That's I'm, awesome. not, I'm not even trying to lose weight. I'm just like, I feel better mm -hmm. and I feel like leaner. I feel everything. So for me, it's a game changer to schedule in the self care for myself. Like every morning, a certain time, I know when the training is going to be here and we're going to get to work. And then like the rest of the day is gravy. It's like, I've done something for myself. I think so many people neglect right. themselves. They put off their self care last and it's sad to me because it should be the first thing we do is take care of ourselves. Not the last thing, not like, oh, I'll get to it next year.
but I need to focus on everyone else in my life first. Mm. It's like you get to be selfish first. That's why I think the first two hours of your day should be for you. The other the 16 cup. hours a day can be for everything else you have, other responsibilities, your kids, family, partners, career. I mean, if you got eight, eight hours of sleep, two hours of, uh, for you, and what does that leave you with? Uh, 14 hours of everything else. So 14 hours of your day can be for everything else, but you got to give at least two hours a day to you. Love that. Yeah. And that's actually goes into my next question. So in your last book. I'm like book, reading your mind. Yes. Okay, it's just the transitions are so easy. So in your last book, you had the daily flow formula. So what does your daily flow look mm -hmm. like now? And how did you kind of build that over the years? I think it evolves with the season of my life and what's happening. So right now I'm in a process where there's something happening with a book and I've got to make sure I just schedule it. Everything is scheduled. Mm. If I don't have a schedule, my life is chaotic. I could have six things scheduled in a day and I feel fine because I know where I need to be next and I know what to prepare for. If we don't know what we're preparing for, it's stressful. It's overwhelming. It's like, ah, uh, it's too much is happening just because you're not clear on your schedule. Right. As an athlete, I always had a schedule for practice. We knew what we were getting ourselves into every single day. Even if it was going to be the worst drill or exercise we had peace of mind around it because it was organized and structured. Most people don't have a structured day or structured year or life. It's kind of random and chaotic feeling. So plan your day. I have a great assistant that plans everything for me based on what is important towards my vision and what's not. So I say yes to things that fulfill the vision of the season. I say no to everything else unless I just want to do it. And then I have someone help execute the vision from my schedule and so that's how I organize it all. So yeah. you have a vision for your season. How do you schedule out your visions for each season? <laughs> Are it's they really different like, throughout the year? And it's really like I'm planning kind of like a year and a half, two years ahead right now. Yeah. Like while I'm living in the present, like this vision was over two years ago, this book. Right. And I was like, in two years, this is going to come out. Okay. So if the date it launches is this, then I need to have it turned in six months prior. And I need to have the research and the writing done four months earlier. And I need to, so I break it all down based on like the end date of something. And I love that you put every, not every single podcast interview, but like your interviews that you've done all year are in this. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so amazing. And obviously yeah. a lot of planning went to that. Absolutely. A lot of planning. I was like, who are the people I need to interview for this book? What's the research? Who are the psychologists that I need to back up all my points? I went through everything. Mm -hmm. And so I'm planning really like a year and a half, two years out. I'm planning broader and bigger with like concepts but also like things could change in a minute that I don't want to be like this is my life's vision like I'm here heading here in five to ten years anything could change in a moment right the day I started this podcast my life changed I didn't know all these things were going to happen but as things started to to build momentum I was like here's a new possibility for the vision so let me go start going down this path like Maybe here's where we could be like in five to 10 years. But let's start like two years out. Like what is this going to look like? And then some of the things I started two years out, like things started breaking off into like different type of vision. It wasn't the right. same thing. It was like it's kind of going a little bit in the same direction, a little over here. And, and so I'm flexible and open to mm -hmm. new ideas. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't know I was going to do a live event last year, but I was inspired by one that I spoke at. And I was like, I can see this from my vision. I can see this from my audience. It fits. I could see it in my mind. Everything we just experienced a few weeks ago, I saw it. Like by speaking at this other conference and I was like, God, wouldn't it be awesome if this happened and this and drums and this music and these speakers and like workouts in the morning. I was just like seeing it in my mind. And I was like, okay, when's the date? We set a date. We booked a venue and said, now we got to figure it out. That was like a year before. And things continue to evolve and branch out with – new books, new content, as the times are evolving, as people are like, here's my biggest pain that I'm dealing with right now. I'm like, hmm, maybe we can lean into that. Because mm. it's really to serve human beings with what they're struggling with. So you figure out what people are struggling with, mainly from your relationships, your podcast episodes. Anything. Anything? Anything that I'm facing with in my life. Mm -hmm. I'm like, f the podcast for me was to help overcome the biggest struggles for me. And then I was like, oh, other people are facing the same thing? Let me find out how much they're struggling with this. Oh, okay, this is interesting. Other, there's a need here for this. And um, 
yeah, so my, my, my vision, I like to think broad and big in terms of the future, but I'm also like, it's really like a year and a half, two years out game plan because anything could change in any moment. And, um, but that's how I think. Like I'm already on to the, like I'm living fully present for the podcasts I do, my events, this book, which is out now, coming out. But I'm also like at night at 10 o'clock, I'm game <laughs> planning and writing content that's going to come out in two years. Right. Because I want to be ahead of everyone in my industry as well. I don't want to be reactive, which I think a lot of people are. Mm. The most successful businesses are constantly innovative. We just had the uh, head brand manager and marketing of Uber on just mm, before I saw you that in. on your story. And she was like, I was just driving in the self, the, the, the person, the self-driving cars. She was like, I was just doing this and testing it. Oh, it was terrifying. Amazing. Yeah. Uber was a platform that was just people driving their own cars, right, to to make money. But they've been spending all this money innovating on like, well, in five to ten years, really what we're going to need to eliminate all these accidents, all this drunk driving, all this texting, like we need people not driving. We need cars that drive themselves. So they're investing and innovating for right. something that's going to take years to happen. And that's what I'm constantly planning, trying to do on a smaller scale. Like, I don't have this big budget like Uber. I'm not the resources of them. But it's like, what are the things that I could be doing now that people aren't doing that is going to be innovative? That's why I'm working on a documentary. I'm working on like different types of campaigns. I'm working on a project with Facebook. I'm like trying to innovate. And some of these things may completely fail or just kind of be like, eh, that was interesting and did what it did. Mm-hmm. And other things are going to set me in a whole new trajectory. Still the same vision of impacting people and helping people overcome the challenges and live a better life. But it might be another mechanism that gets me there. So, yeah, it's it's hard to turn off the ideas for me because I'm just constantly, <laughs> yeah. It's like tunnel visioning them so you can figure out exactly what you have to do. But having that broader vision really helps. It does. And then narrowing down for the year and a half, two years. So is there anything you can A year, talk but really about? like two, three months. Yeah. Like this, the I had the Summit of Greatness, which we had like, you know, a whole year gearing up for. But it really came down to like the final six weeks. It's like it's game time. Now is like mm-hmm. playoffs, getting ready for the championship. It just so happened to me we timed this up with this book that right after the summit, I was like, okay, we got six weeks. It's playoffs. And now I'm like less of that where I'm like getting to the championship day. Sports analogies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, okay, we need a game plan and we need a strategy. We need this. We need this. We need this. And I've been working on it all year, but it's like now it's time to focus on one thing. So I said today on my team meeting, I was like, nothing else matters but the book launch, mm-hmm. which is less than 30 days away. Like all hands on deck. Like – Focus on this first and then get to something else if if you get this complete. But first and foremost is the mission and impact we want to make on the men who will read two to three pages of this. Because if we can get people to read two to three pages, hopefully they'll read more. Oh, and hopefully yeah. they'll test. Easily. Maybe they'll try something in their life where they'll start to heal and not suffer. And if we can do that, we can have a ripple effect in the world where there's these killings happening in Vegas and all over the world and these racial wars. I'm just like, what is going on with our world right now? It's like, it just blows my mind the amount of pain and fear that so many people live in. And I'm like, let's start to focus on that. Mm. And it starts with each one of us working on ourselves on how we can improve. That's what it is. I love that. And this is like a perfect time for this book to come out. Like you said, with all of the things going on, because it really starts from the inside of every single human because humans do things not because of guns or not because of what they have available to them because of their hurt inside. Yes. And that's why this book is so important. So what's your favorite piece of this book after writing it, after going through it a thousand million times? I I really like uh, at the end of each chapter, I talk to men specifically and I say the same mm. thing at the end of each chapter and I'll find one part. I love that part too. Yeah. And, um, right there. yeah. And I say what's available for you when you drop this mask and I'll just talk about, uh, the athlete man, which I just happened to open up to, which is perfect <laughs> for me. Perfect for you. And I, and I, it's this quick little paragraph paragraph. I say, remember athlete man, that you are a gift and there's so much to celebrate about you. The people, who care about you the most have been waiting to see what's behind your mask. It's time to reveal the real you. 
These are some of the things that can flood back into your life when you drop this mask. And then I walk through all the things that have been missing from the person's life. Mm. Like here's what's available when you actually reveal yourself. And here are the things you can start to feel. And those are the things that these men have always wanted but have been too afraid to accept. And so that's the part that I really like the most. It's just like bringing it, bound to, bringing it back down to a simple place of like, I know you want this thing, but you're only going to get it when you start to like reveal yourself to the people that care about you the most. So let's do it. And coming from someone like you and then all of the people that you have in this book, like Steve Weatherford and Travis Pastrana uh-huh. and Ty Lopez, yep. it can honestly help open up men so, so much. And then you also at the end – to speak specifically to men but also specifically to women about what they can do after they read this chapter exactly as i was writing this for myself and then other men like me i was like this is actually i think more women are going to read this than i men. loved it as yeah. a woman reading it like i was that's what i thought hooked. Yeah. i was like this is the keys to the kingdom for mm-hmm. women i was yes. like if you want to understand your father why he's been so angry or passive your whole life or never showed emotion or never told he loved you or whatever or your your boyfriend, your husband, why they are the way they are, your son, why he like never talks to you or never looks right. you in your eyes. Like if you want to know why, this will tell you why. This yeah. will give you a better understanding of the men in your life and how to connect with them without making them wrong mm-hmm. for the things that they're not doing. But instead, and not getting angry at not them getting for angry how at they them. are. Because if you do that, you're just going to make them put on the mask more. Yeah. You focus on the bad of a man, it's going to make him disconnected even more. When you focus on the good of a man, it's going to make him feel seen, acknowledged, and loved. And he's going to want to do more good things. Because the mask is on because of the shame and the guilt that they feel. So if you put them on that more, it just keeps the mask on. It fuses it to them because it makes them feel safer. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. So what are the three main messages that you would like listeners who are listening right now and watching to get out of this book? Three main messages is to understand that you matter. You matter because you're here for a reason and there's something unique about you that no one else in the world has. So you get to understand and embrace whatever that uniqueness is. So you get to matter. The second thing is you don't have to hold the pain anymore. The pain doesn't support you in living a better life and impacting other people. And the more you hold on to this mask and the suffering and the pain, the less you're going to make an impact and be meaningful and valuable in the world. So let go of the pain. Let's say the third thing is to forgive yourself. Mm. Like forgive yourself for everything you're embarrassed of and ashamed of and afraid of and insecure about and all the things that you've messed up with your entire life. Just forgive it. Forgive it. And then forgive everyone else who's done anything to you or for you or not for you. Like forgive everyone. Forgive yourself because that is is what causes a lot of this pain and it's what causes a lot of the insecurities and it's what causes a lot of us to wear the masks so forgive yourself and um, and start revealing the real you I love just love that so much and I think that this again I can't say it enough this message is so important and I love that you have all of these incentives on your website for people to pre-order the book and this is coming out on October 31st and that's the day that the book comes out correct yes so if you are on Lewis's website or if you've seen his website he has a couple of incentives like a workbook Uh you can get access to interviews you can get access to him specifically with um webinar q a's or like a 30 minute interview with you you mm-hmm. can get someone to speak at your event depending on how much you buy and for me what i'm going to do to help this message get out there it's not just helping lewis get on the new york times bestseller list anymore it's about this very important message that so many people need to read i've read through the entire book and i can't even imagine if this gets in the hands of like hundreds of thousands of people how much of an impact it'll make on the world so what i'm going to do is anybody who purchases lewis's book Email us your receipt, hello at amandabucci.com. I'm coming out with a mini new course. I haven't released it anywhere yet. It's a mindset course that teaches you about confidence, money, breaking past limiting beliefs, and engineering your life. I haven't released it to anybody yet. So if you guys order this book, I will send it this to you for free. So please wow. just order it. Amazing. It is amazing. I'm going to order my book so I can get it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How many books do you have in this in this apartment? I got a lot. I've given so many away. I we bet. just gave away like boxes and boxes because we get so many from people that are like yeah. want to come on the show yep. and I literally it's hard for me to read a book like it's really hard for me to like 
get into it and even start and finish I want to. I have the intention to. Well, you get the gist of it, and you're like, great. That's, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But um, well, when I can finish a book, though, it's pretty – it's pretty powerful for me too. So I appreciate you finishing. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I completely agree. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. I Lois. love you. I appreciate you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Amanda. And thank you guys for watching and listening. Make sure you guys order the book. Thank you again for your time. Thank and I'll you. catch you guys in the next episode.